ownership. Remember the traditional attributes of ownership. Generally, what are the rights of an owner? The right to use, right to the fruits, yung use abutendi. That should never be interpreted to mean the right to abuse. There is no such thing. Use abutendi simply means the right to consume the thing by its use. Right to dispose, right to vindicate or recover. You also remember the limitations on the rights of ownership. These are limitations which may come either from the state in the exercise of its inherent powers of government, police power, eminent domain, taxation, or this may be limitations imposed by specific provisions of law, like the provisions of the civil code dealing with legal easements. This may be limitations imposed by the person transmitting the property. If I am donating property to you, I may impose in the deed of donation certain limitations on your use of the property, for example. In connection with the rights of ownership, you remember the doctrine of self-help. Under Article 429, an owner or lawful possessor is allowed by law the use of such force as may be reasonably necessary to repel or prevent an actual or threatened unlawful deprivation or physical invasion or usurpation of his property. Only reasonable force should be used. The doctrine can be invoked only at the time when there is an actual or threatened unlawful physical invasion, not thereafter. If the property has already been taken by the third person, you are not allowed to use force to get it back. You must invoke the aid of judicial authorities. One of the best examples in connection with the doctrine of self-help would of course be the case of German Management and Services Incorporated. Here was a landowner. He wanted to develop his property, and so he executed the power of attorney in favor of German management services to develop that property. German management services went to the property. They discovered that certain individuals are occupying the property. They are cultivating the property. So German management used physical force to oust these occupants who were cultivating portions of that property. Later on, they tried to invoke the principle of self-help. Court said that's not proper because it is not disputed that when they tried to enter the property, those occupants were already there. They had been cultivating the land for some time. A party in peaceable, quiet possession shall not be turned out by a strong hand, violence or terror, according to the court. The doctrine of self-help can only be exercised and invoked at the time of actual or threatened dispossession. When possession has already been lost, the owner must resort to judicial process for the recovery of his property. He cannot take the law into his own hands. The owner of property has the right to enclose his property with a fence, a wall, or any other means. There is a very beautiful case in this connection. I referred to Custodio versus Court of Appeals. There was a property owned by a person. There was no fence around this property. So some of his neighbors were passing through his land to reach the public road. Later on, the property owner decided to enclose his property with a fence. Consequently, his neighbors could no longer pass through his land. They had to take a more roundabout route to reach the public street. They filed a complaint for damages. The court said this is a case of damnum absque injuria. The property owner was simply exercising a right explicitly granted to him by law, the right to enclose his property with a fence. If in the meantime, great inconvenience was caused to his neighbors who now had to take a longer route to reach the street, it's just too bad. But they obviously do not have the legal right to claim damages. Please take note that when the case was decided, there was no easement yet. Wala pang easement. 
it was only after the case was decided that the court said an easement should be created, but they should pay indemnity. So, as long as there is no easement yet, you have the perfect right to enclose your property with a fence. That's very clear in Article 430 of the Civil Code. A property owner, of course, has the use utendi, the right to use his property. But the right to use one's property must be exercised in such a way as not to injure others. Sik uteret tuum utalienum nun laidas. So use your own as not to injure others. In one case, there were two adjoining properties. The owner of the higher property built their own certain artificial bodies of water. There were artificial lakes, there were water pots, etc. Unfortunately, uh, during inclement or bad weather, some of these constructions were washed away and they fell to the adjoining lower estate. The lower court dismissed the case. The Supreme Court said the case should be reinstated, applying Article 431. While you have the right to use your property, you should use it in such a way as not to injure others. Obviously, the court considered the construction of these artificial bodies of water, artificial lakes, etc., on the higher estate as something which causes, during bad weather, some damage or prejudice to the adjoining lower estate. You also take note of the provisions of Article 432 of the Civil Code, sometimes referred to as the emergency doctrine, emergency rule. If you are the owner of a thing, the law says you have no right to prohibit the interference of another person with your property as long as the interference is necessary to prevent an imminent danger and as long as the threatened damage or injury is much greater, as a matter of fact, the loss is much greater than the damage which would arise to you from the interference with your property. In this connection, the view has been advanced to which I agree that negligence on the part of the person interfering does not preclude resort to the rule under Article 432. If, for example, while I was using my car, another vehicle owned and driven by Mr. X careened into the street and well, it was being driven recklessly, slammed into a Meralco post and started to billow with smoke, it was obviously on fire. Under this article, Mr. X, although he was negligent in driving his car, would have the right to interfere with my property. If I happen to have a fire extinguisher, for example, I do not have the right to prohibit his interference with the use of that fire extinguisher. His negligence does not preclude him from invoking the rule under Article 432. Obviously, any possible damage which might be caused to me through the use of my fire extinguisher is much less than the damage which would result to the complete burning of his car. So, in that case, I submit the requirements of Article 432 would clearly be met. You just read Articles 43 and 434. Actual possession under claim of ownership raises a disputable presumption of ownership. The true owner must resort to judicial process if he wants to recover his property. And then the requirement that in an action to recover property, the property must be, number one, identified, and the plaintiff must rely upon the strength of his own evidence and not on the weakness of the defendant's claim, which is in accord with the rule that he who alleges has the burden of proof. Article 435, on the other hand, is simply a restatement of the basic principle in constitutional law. One of the inherent powers of the state is, of course, the power of eminent domain, Property may be taken for public use as long as there is payment of just compensation. Article 436, on the other hand, is a restatement of the rule on police power. Of course, the moment the state, the government, exercises its police power, then property rights must necessarily yield. If property is taken or damaged or destroyed as a consequence of the exercise of police power, of course, there is no right to any indemnity. The only possible indemnity you get is the, the feeling of satisfaction that somehow you have contributed to the common good. I call your attention to Article 437 at this point. 
The owner of property is the owner not only of its surface, but of everything under it. If you are the owner of a parcel of land, you own not only the surface, but everything under it. Of course, that does not necessarily mean that that provision, everything under it, is to be taken in its literal sense. If there are, for example, minerals under your land, that does not belong to you. That belongs to our Kabalikat sa Kaunlaran state, Regalian Doctrine. All right. The question is, up to what depth will you be considered the owner of what is beneath your land? Does that extend up to the middle of the earth? The rule of thumb is, it extends only up to such depth as you can still make use of it. And in a case decided by the Supreme Court, it would seem that it is quite deep, at least from the point of view of the Supreme Court. I refer to NPC versus Ibrahim, for example. There was a property owner. Unknown to him, the NPC had constructed a tunnel passing beneath his land because the NPC was drawing water from Agus River, if I remember correctly. Hidden treasure. I think you will agree if you have been reading previous bar examination questions. Paborito ito, for one reason or another. Hidden treasure. Remember number one, first of all, what is considered as treasure? The law defines that in Article 438. It is any hidden and unknown deposit of money, jewelry, or other precious objects, the lawful ownership of which does not appear. In other words, hindi alam kung sino may ari. If you see your neighbor one midnight digging a hole on a parcel of land near your house, and hiding a jar full of jewelry that is not hidden treasure. Alam mo kung sino ang nagbaon. The lawful ownership must not appear. The law enumerates money, jewelry, or other precious objects. Applying the Ehusdem Generis rule, that should be limited to things of similar nature. Therefore, again, this does not include mineral deposits okay? or oil. Hindi pwedeng hidden treasure yan. Okay? Pag-aari yan ng ating kabalikat sa kaunlaran, the state. Alright. What is the rule with respect to hidden treasure? It belongs to the owner of the land, building, or other property in which it is found. If it is found by another person, in other words, somebody other than the owner of the property, and by chance, you have the one-half, one-half rule, 50-50. One half will belong to the owner, one half will belong to the finder. If, however, the finder happens to be a trespasser, he is not entitled to any share. The law requires that the finding should be by chance. In other words, this would usually mean and I think the traditional meaning ascribed to this phrase is that the finding was not intended, totally unexpected, not intended. In other words, the finder was not looking for the treasure. Supposing that a man has been given the use of rock of a parcel of land by his friend, and so he's staying there on that land, and then one day there was an old man who gave him what appeared to be an old map, and the old man told him that on a part of that property, there is treasure buried by pirates a long time ago. And so this Yusuf Rakhchuri, believing what was told to him by that old man, digs at the precise spot indicated in that old map. And true enough, he finds hidden treasure. Will he be entitled to any share of the treasure? Will his finding be considered as a finding by chance? If you go by the traditional view as to the meaning of by chance, then it would seem that he would not fall under that category because he intentionally looked for the treasure. But I think this logic and good sense in the view advanced by others, according to them, when the law says by chance, that should be interpreted to mean by a stroke of good fortune. Let me put it this way. A lot of people have been engaged all over the Philippines in the search for the so-called Yamashita treasure. Even books have been written about the search for this treasure. A lot of people have engaged in diggings, have spent millions even to finance these excavations. But a lot of them have turned, well, were not able to locate any treasure at all. 
In other words, even if you look for treasure, there is no guarantee, even if you are using an old map, there is no guarantee that you'll be able to find one. So, in that sense, if you do find treasure, your finding can be considered as by a stroke of good fortune. And in that sense, it can be considered as a finding by chance. If the finder was precisely employed by the owner of the land to look for treasure there, the finder, I submit, will not be entitled to any share under Article 438. His remuneration will depend on his contract or agreement with the landowner as to how the treasure will be shared or as to his compensation, direct compensation for the work which would be undertaken. Let's now go to accession. Another favorite area, of course. The general rule is contained in Article 440. If you are the owner of property, by right of accession, you are also entitled, you also own everything which is produced by that property or which is incorporated with that property or which is attached to that property either naturally or artificially. The owner has the right by accession to everything produced, incorporated, or attached to that property. There are various kinds of accession. You have accession discreta, the right given to the owner to everything which is produced by the property. This is in turn subdivided into the three types of fruits which can possibly be produced. Natural fruits, industrial fruits, and civil fruits. Natural fruits are the spontaneous products of the soil as well as the young and other products of animals. So, animal manure, that's natural fruit. Mushrooms, mushrooms which are not cultivated, which just sprout in the fields, especially after a thunderstorm the previous evening, that would be considered as spontaneous products of the soil. Industrial fruits on the other hand, are those which are produced by lands through human labor and cultivation. If you're talking of mushrooms which are produced by a farm, they are cultured, etc., that would be industrial rather than natural fruits. You have the third type of fruit, civil fruits. Rents, leases of lands and other property, life annuities, and other similar income. And then you have accession continua. This is the right given to the owner to everything which is incorporated or attached to his property, either naturally or artificially. Subclassification of accession continua. First, with respect to immovables, accession industrial, which covers building, planting, sowing, and you have accession natural. What would fall under accession natural? Alluvion, abolition, change of riverbed, formation of islands. With regard to personal or movable property, you have adjunction or conjunction, commission or confusion, specification. To the owner belongs all of the fruits. Do not forget, however, the rule under Article 443. A very important rule. He who receives the fruits has the obligation to reimburse the expenses made by another person in their production, gathering, and preservation. Please take note that in Article 443, the law does not distinguish between people or persons in good faith and persons in bad faith. It applies to everyone. You might have been in bad faith, but as long as you spend for the production, gathering, and preservation of the fruits, the owner who is able to get back possession is obligated under Article 443 to reimburse you for the expenses you incurred in production, gathering, preservation. Please take note, however, another important thing we have to remember in connection with Article 443, that the article would not apply if the fruits have not yet been gathered. So, if the fruits are still ungathered, 
you don't apply Article 443. Consequently, if you happen to be in bad faith and you have not yet gathered these fruits, when the lawful owner or possessor recovers the property from you, you don't apply 443. You simply lose all of these ungathered fruits, applying the rule with respect to possessors in bad faith as well as planters and sowers in bad faith. He who is in bad faith loses everything that he has built, planted, or sown. Article 445 tells us when these rules on accession with respect to immovable property would apply and when they would not. What do I mean? The law says whatever is built, planted, or sown on the land of another. Underline that phrase, land of another together with the improvements and repairs made thereon, shall belong to the owner of the land. If I build, plant, or sow on my own land, therefore, these rules on accession would find no proper application. You apply these rules if something is built, planted, or sown on the land of another. Because if it's the owner of the land himself who builds, plants, or sow, there's no question. He's really the owner of everything. As a matter of fact, there is a presumption under Article 446 that all works of sowing and planting are presumed to have been made by the owner and at his expense. Of course, that's a disputable presumption, but it's a presumption just the same. Let's first tackle the situation contemplated in Article 447. What is the scenario in Article 447? Here is a landowner and he decides to build on his property using the materials of another person. So, simply, simple situation. I have a parcel of land. I build a house there or any other thing. But I use your materials. Of course, there are always two possibilities. Either I am in good faith or in bad faith. When would I be in good faith in that situation? If I thought, that I had the right to use those materials. If I thought that I owned those materials, I would be in bad faith if I knew that you were the owner of those materials. And despite that knowledge, I still use them. If I am in good faith, kala ko sa akin yung materials na yun. What's my obligation under Article 447? The law says, I should pay their value. Oh, that's fair and square. Can I be held liable for damages? The answer is no, because precisely, I was in good faith. I simply have to pay the value of the materials owned by you. If I am in bad faith, ah, of course, I have to pay the value of the materials plus damages. Damages would, of course, be intended to penalize me for my bad faith. What about you, the owner of the materials? What would be your rights? The law says you can remove your materials. If it is possible to do so, without injury to the work constructed. If it is possible to remove your materials without injury, that means that it's not really a case of real attachment because it's possible to remove eh, without injury. There has been no real case of attachment. At any rate, the law says you can remove your materials if it's possible to do so without injury to the plantings, constructions, or works. If I was in bad faith, however, ah, the law says you can remove your materials in any case, aside from your right to recover damages. So if I'm in good faith, limited right of removal on your part. Scenario contemplated by Article 448. Here, the law contemplates a situation where there is a landowner and somebody builds, plants, or sows on his property. Again, we have to determine whether the builder, planter, or sower is in good faith or in bad faith. The landowner also, because even the landowner in that case can be in bad faith. When will the landowner be in bad faith in that situation? If he knew that somebody was building on his property and he permitted, he allowed the building to continue. Sige lang, magtayo ka dyan. Tapos ka. After a while, akin yan. Bad faith yun. Of course, if he was not aware that somebody was building, planting, or sowing on his property, he would obviously be in good faith. The builder, planter, or sower, on the other hand, would be in good faith if he is not aware of any defect or flaw in his title or mode of acquisition. The builder thinks he owns that 
land or he thought he had the legal right to build thereon. He'll be in good faith. If he was aware that he had no legal right to build on that property, but he built, planted just the same, he would obviously be in bad faith. What would be the respective rights? Assuming both parties, landowner and builder, are in good faith, the rights would be as follows. The landowner can appropriate what has been built, planted, or sown on his land. Of course, he has to pay proper indemnity to the builder, planter, or sower. In the case of building and planting, the landowner also has the option of selling the land occupied by the building or planting to the builder or planter. He cannot, however, avail of that option, ask the builder or planter to buy the land, if the value of the land is considerably more than the value of the building or planting. Please take note, the law uses the phrase considerably more. If the value of the land and the value of the building or planting are more or less the same, or if the difference in the value is not too much, then the landowner is not precluded from availing of that option. Kasi dapat ang difference ng value, the value of the land must be considerably more than the value of the building or planting. In that case, they can simply enter into a lease agreement. If they cannot agree on the terms of the lease, the court shall fix the terms thereof according to Article 448. Please take note that Article 448 distinguishes between a planter and a sower. Obviously, parehong nagtatanim yan. What's the difference? You are a sower if what you actually sow is something which will not produce fruits for a long period of time. Rice, for example. So once you harvest, you have to sow again. Sower ka niyan. But if what you plant is something which will last for years and continue producing fruits year after year, you are not a sower, you are a planter. Alam mo, nagtanim ka ng punong mangga. That's a case of planting because what you have planted will last for years and continue producing fruits year after year without having to replant them. If what is involved are bananas, are you a planter or a sower? Ordinarily, I would say that you should be really considered a sower, not a planter. Because the ordinary way of getting the fruits from bananas is by cutting down the trunk. Pag bumagsak na, saka mukukunin yung mga bunches of bananas. Although, I understand that in some areas in South America, yung mga large banana plantations, hindi daw ganon. They simply get the bunches of bananas and they are somehow able to produce fruits for quite some time. So, the landowner has the right to appropriate but he must pay the proper indemnity. What is the indemnity? Supposing that the builder spent 500000 when he built at the time when the landowner exercises his option to appropriate, the building was already worth $5 million. What is the amount which will constitute the proper indemnity? The Supreme Court has already decided that point. It is the market value at the time when the indemnity is to be paid. So in that problem, although only 500000 was spent, since the property at the time when indemnity is to be paid, the property was already worth 5 million, it is 5 million which should be paid by the landowner to the builder. If the landowner decides to appropriate, he has to pay the indemnity. And prior to the payment of the proper indemnity to the builder, the builder has the right of retention. If you are the landowner and I am the builder, we are both in good faith. I built on your land. You inform me that your option is to appropriate the building. So the price of indemnity is let's say 10 million. Prior to your payment of 10 million to me, I have the right to retain the building and to continue occupying your land. That is the right of retention given by law to me. What is the purpose of the right of retention? To ensure that I will be paid properly the indemnity due to me. Now, 
Supposing that during this period of retention, while you have not yet paid me the indemnity, naghahanap ka pa ng pera ang pambayad sa akin, the building is lost because of Casa Fortuito. Tinamaan ng kidlat, nasunog, completely incinerated. What's the net effect? Ah, sorry na lang ako. I lose my right of retention because you are not obligated as landowner to pay for buildings or improvements which have already ceased to exist. So, wala na. No more right of retention. Now, during the period of retention, can the landowner demand from the builder the payment of rent? Can you tell me? Oh, but you have to pay rent. Teka muna. Bayad ka naman ng renta dyan sa inoccupy nung building mo. Lupa ko yan eh. In the meantime, so you tell me, I am deprived of the use of my property. Can I be required to pay rent? The answer is no. As long as there is a right of retention brought about by the earlier exercise by the landowner of the option to appropriate, as long as the builder has the right of retention, he cannot be compelled to pay rent. Why? Because if he is required to pay rent, that will negate his security for the payment of the indemnity. Supposing that the property, the building, which I constructed in good faith on your land, is producing fruits. Portions of that building are being leased by me to third persons who are paying me rent. During the period when I have the right of retention, who is entitled to the rentals being paid by the tenants? Can these rentals be offset with the indemnity due to me? In one early case, I refer to Ortiz versus Kayanan, eh, which involved possessor in good faith. There were some improvements for which he was entitled to indemnity. There was a right of retention because the indemnity had not yet been paid. During the period when he had a right of retention, no, hindi pa siya nababayaran ng indemnity for some useful improvements there, a detour was constructed through the property. Kasi one highway was being constructed or repaired by the government. In the meantime, vehicles had to take a detour through the property which was under right of retention. And tolls were collected. Lahat ng vehicles dumadaan doon, may toll. Ang tanong doon is, can the tolls collected by the possessor who had a right of retention be offset with the indemnity that is due to him? Ang sabi ng Supreme Court doon sa Ortiz v. Kayanan, yes, pwede raw. In other words, the right of retention, according to the Supreme Court in that case, is not merely a security, but rather a way for the extinguishment of the obligation to pay indemnity. So, pwede raw. In some other cases, decided the Supreme Court, Pexon, for example, sabi ng Supreme Court, hindi pwede. If fruits are collected by the builder in good faith during the period when he is exercising his right of retention, these fruits... These rentals cannot be compensated with the indemnity due him. Why? Because he is the one entitled, as a consequence of his right of retention, to the possession and tenancy of the property. He is also entitled to these fruits. So there can be no compensation between the fruits and the indemnity for the simple reason that they are both due to him. They both belong to him. You know, admittedly, I could sense a certain ambivalence on the part of court decisions. One reason why, according to some decisions, the builder in good faith is no longer entitled to the fruits during the period of retention is because, you know, under the law on possession, the moment the builder becomes aware there is a defect in the mode or title of acquisition, then, strictly speaking, he's no longer in good faith. And from that moment on, under the law on possession, he's not entitled to the fruits. That's the basis of these Supreme Court decisions to the effect that he's not entitled to the fruits. Personally, I think the better view is that he would still be entitled. In other words, as long as he built in good faith, he cannot be deprived of the rights pertaining to a builder in good faith, one of which is the right of retention, even if, well, considerably, it is to be assumed that at some point, he becomes aware that there is a defect or flaw in his title or mode of acquisition. He continues to exercise the rights of a builder in good faith, one of which is the right of retention. And the right of retention, I submit, necessarily implies tenancy and continued possession. As such, he should be entitled still to the fruits. And there can be no compensation between the fruits and the amount of indemnity due to him. The option is given to the landowner, not to the builder. 
it is the landowner who decides whether he will appropriate what has been built or planted or whether he will ask the builder or planter to buy the land. That option is given to him. The builder cannot compel the landowner to simply sell the land to him or at least the portion thereof occupied by his building. He cannot do that because the option is not given to him. The option is given by law to the landowner. Why is the option given by law to the landowner? In the Proverbs of Dumlao, the Supreme Court very clearly says, because the right of the landowner is all there. Now, can the landowner simply refuse to exercise either of the options under Article 448? He does not want to appropriate the building. Sabi niya, ayaw ko niyang building mo. Anong gagawin ko? Ang pangit niyang bahay mo. Neither does he want to sell the land occupied by the building. Ayaw ko ding ibenta. In short, He simply tells the builder, lumayas ka, tanggalin mo yung building mo dyan. Dahil hindi mo lupa yan, lupa ko yan. Can the landowner do that? The answer is, he cannot. He cannot just refuse to exercise his option and simply ask for the removal of what in good faith has been built or planted on his land. The options are limited to those in Article 448. But supposing that the landowner avails or elects the option of selling his land. O sige, bilhin mo na lang yan. Ito ang presyo. And the value of the land, let's assume further, is not considerably more than that of the building. The builder, however, is unable to pay. Wala, kahit nasunukin mo yung builder, wala kang maaamoy na pera. Wala siyang pera. Pambaya doon sa land. Ah, sabi ng Supreme Court, if that is the case, then the landowner can ask for the removal of the building. If having opted to sell his land and assuming the value is not considerably more than that of the building, the builder is unable to pay, then that's a situation when the landowner can actually ask for the removal of the, of the building. Any other remedies available to the landowner if that were the case? The builder is unable to pay. Of course, there is always the remedy of simply entering into a lease. Oh, sige, hindi ko pala kayang bayaran. Sige, lease na lang tayo. And there is a third remedy. So they can enter into a lease. Number two, the landowner can ask for removal. And third option, the landowner can ask for the sale of both the land and the building. The proceeds of the sale will be first applied to the value of the land. The rest, ponong matera, any excess, will be delivered to the owner of the house or the building. Prior to the time that the landowner exercises his option of either appropriation or sale prior to his moment of decision, the builder would of course have been occupying the land of the landowner. Can he be required to pay rent for his occupancy during that period prior to the exercise by the landowner of his option? The answer is yes, he should be. The moment the landowner, Weber, exercises the option to appropriate, there arises the right of pretension on the part of the builder. From that moment, he cannot be compelled to pay rent. If the landowner opts instead of appropriation, ang option niya is sale of the land to the builder. Can rent be demanded in the meantime? The answer is yes, of course. Rent will have to be paid until such time when the property, when the land is in fact acquired by the builder. Pag na-acquire na Of course, he's the owner already. He simply does not have to pay rent anymore. Next point. We said earlier that these rules on accession on a mobile property would not apply to a situation where it is the landowner himself who builds or plants on his property. Diba? Kasi sabi natin, under the law, planted, built, sown on the land of another. Kung sarili mong lupa, no application to. Now, having said that, It follows, therefore, that if a co-owner of property builds or plants on the property under co-ownership, these rules would not apply because a co-owner is the owner of an ideal aliquot share of the whole. And as a matter of fact, under the law on co-ownership, a co-owner has the right to use the property under co-ownership as long as he does not prevent the other co-owners from similarly using it. So, if something is built or planted by a co-owner, these rules on accession do not apply. However, 
if the co-ownership has already been terminated by a partition of the property. And after the partition, it is discovered that one of the previous co-owners has built on a part of the property which was later on adjudicated to another co-owner, then the rules under Article 448 should apply. The co-owner who had earlier built on the property under co-ownership, but a portion of whose building is discovered to encroach upon the part adjudicated in the partition to the other co-owners, will have the rights of a builder in good faith. Alimbawa, we are the two co-owners. During the existence of our co-ownership of our parcel plan, I built a building on that land. Later on, we agreed to partition the property. Tapos ang co-ownership by partition. Pagka-partition natin, na-discovery, yung building ko pala, a few square meters of my building occupy the part allotted to you under our partition agreement. Article 448 can be applied. I will be considered as a builder in good faith with the same rights under Article 448. The claim of good faith may be made by a successor in interest of the original builder. In one case, a certain land together with the building standing thereon was purchased by a buyer. Later on, upon a resurvey of the land, it was discovered that a portion of the building encroached upon the adjacent property. Sabi the Supreme Court, yes, the buyer in this case can invoke good faith and the provisions of Article 448 can apply. Well, to a certain extent, it's quite amusing to remember some of the cases involved. In one case, can you imagine, there was a couple, they bought a lot from a subdivision. Usually, mga subdivision, lot number so-and-so, block number so-and-so. The time finally came when they decided to construct a house. So, Punta sila subdivision. Tinanlong nila yung representative of the subdivision developer. We are going to construct na. Saan mga saan nga ba yung lote na nabili namin? Ah, ito ho. Tinuro. Itong, ito, itong lote niyo. They constructed. Nakdantokwa. Hindi pala yun yung lote. Nagkamali ng turo. Can they invoke the rights of a builder in good faith? Of course. They can invoke the rights of a builder in good faith. By the way, even if the property involved is registered property, Alimbawa, magkatabi yung lote natin, pareho may titulo. Of course, when property is titled, very precise and description niya ng boundaries. Can you still claim good faith if the properties are covered by a torrent's title? The answer is yes, because if you are an ordinary person, unless you happen to be an expert in the science of surveying, you are not expected to know the precise boundaries of your property even if your property is covered by a torrent's title. Ano malay natin kung nasa niya mga north 70 degrees na yan? Although, of course, meron na ngayon mga GPS. Di ba? Sa cellphone lang, meron yan eh. Sabihin sa iyo kung nasa ang lugar ka. Accurate to within 5 meters. But even then, I submit, the, the rule is still applies. Unless you happen to be an expert in the science of surveying, you should not be held accountable for a mistake. So, Pwede pa rin good faith. Pero, ibang usapan naman kung, halimbawa, I built on a lot in Manila. May nakita akong bahantel lote. Nagtayo ako doon. Nung sinita ako ng may-ari, sabi ko, ay, ganun ba? Pasensya, akala ko lote ko ito eh. Eh, wala naman akong titulo mas kaya ano. Ang pag-aari ko nasa Quezon City. Wala akong property sa Manila. Can I claim good faith? No. I should not be allowed to claim good faith. May mere assertion that I thought I had the legal right to build on the property obviously is a vagrant assertion. Why vagrant? Because it has no visible means of support. So, interpreting vagrant assertion. Next point. Supposing that the builder is in bad faith. Pag builder is in bad faith, napakasimple. He loses everything. He becomes liable for damages. The landowner can demand that you buy his land regardless of the value. No restriction na kailangan ng that it should not be considerably more. Wala yung mga ganong restriction. Basta in bad faith ka, o bilhin mo yung lupa ko. Kung ang building mo is worth 1 million, yung land na tinayuan mo is worth 5 million, pwede ka. You can be compelled to buy the land. Bad faith ka. Pasaway ka. Kasalanan mo. And you are liable for damages. The landowner would have the right to demand removal. Tanggalin mo yan. Lumayas ka sa lupa ko. Basta in bad faith. Wala. You have no rights whatsoever, except isa lang, 
uh, yung recovery of necessary expenses for the preservation of the property. Why so? Kasi pagdating sa necessary expenses, since these are supposedly incurred for the preservation of the property, the landowner himself would have incurred the same expenses, even if he was the one in possession of the property. So, in terms of fairness and basic justice, the law mandates that the builder in bad faith should be entitled to this. By the way, sabi natin, all fruits of the property belong to the owner. Siguraduhin lang natin na talagang fruits. There is an old case, yung bonus. Certain landowners were asked by a certain company, pwede ba, sabi nila, i-mortgage ninyo yung mga lupa ninyo para makasecure kami ng loan. For the risk you are going to take, we will give you certain bonuses. Pumayag, may mortgage. So, binigyan ng bonuses. Are these bonuses fruits? The answer is no, because they were not produced by the land. Eh, hindi yan fruits. They are not even civil fruits. Next point. Supposing that both the landowner and the builder are in bad faith. Madali yan. They are both considered to have acted in good faith. So, you apply the provisions of Article 448. Supposing that the builder used the materials of a third person in building on the land of another. A lot will depend on whether the builder and the landowner are in good faith or in bad faith. Assuming that they are both in good faith, both the builder and the landowner are in good faith, and the material owner is also in good faith, ano magiging rights ng owner ng materials? The owner of the materials, of course, can recover the value of his materials from the builder who used it, but the landowner can be held subsidiarily liable for the value of the materials in case the builder is unable to pay the owner of the materials their value. If, however, the builder is in bad faith and consequently the landowner demands the removal or the demolition of the building, remember that the landowner would have no subsidiary liability. Ano reason? In accession, he who benefits from the accession must pay for it. That's one underlying principle. Kung sinong nakinabang sa accession, dapat magbayad. That's the reason why if the landowner decides to appropriate the building, there is subsidiary liability on his part in case the builder is insolvent. If the landowner, however, decides to ask for the removal, destruction of the building, he does not benefit from that accession and therefore, that's the reason why there would be no subsidiary liability on the part of the landowner. Which is also the reason why if the property is sold by the landowner pending payment of the indemnity to the builder, and tanong is, who will pay the indemnity to the builder? It depends. If in the contract of sale between the landowner and the third person, the landowner was already paid not just the value of the land, but the value of the building as well, then obviously the landowner must pay the value of the building, the proper indemnity to the builder. If on the other hand, the landowner was not paid the value of the building, then he does not benefit from the building. It would then be the buyer who will benefit from the accession it would be the buyer who will have to pay the builder the proper indemnity. I repeat, he who benefits from an accession must be the one to pay for it. Let's now go to the matter of alluvion. We have the provisions of Article 457. If you are the owner of a parcel of land adjoining the bank of a river, and due to the natural action of the water over a period of time, Deposits of river silt are left there by the water such that the area of their, your land gradually increased year after year. You are the owner of that additional area. Your ownership is automatic. The additional area brought about by alluvion automatically belongs to the landowner of that land adjoining the banks of a river. It is not, however, I'm referring to the additional area, it is not, however, automatically registered or covered or protected by the torrent's title of the landowner. He has to register it in his name. And if prior to his registration of that additional area, a third person succeeds in occupying that area, 
claiming it as his own satisfies the requisite for acquisitive prescription that third person would have acquired ownership of that area. So I repeat, huh? if you're the owner of property adjoining the banks of a river, in the course of many years, due to the gradual deposit of river silt, lumaki na lumaki yung area mo, automatically, as long as everything happens naturally, hindi ka nag-construct ng catchment basin or whatever there, no human intervention, you are automatically the owner of the additional area through alluvion. But that additional area is not automatically covered by your torrents title. Kung may torrents title ka sa property mo, your torrents title will not automatically extend to the additional area. Therefore, the additional area can still be acquired by third persons through acquisitive prescription. The increase in the area must be exclusively due to nature. There must be absolutely no human intervention. Otherwise, that's not alluvion. Insofar as areas bordering lakes are concerned, like Laguna de Bay. Laguna de Bay is not a bay. It is a lake. Uh, lakes are large bodies of water which usually have a connection with the river. What about the areas there? If there are additional areas brought about by the action of the water or whatever, to whom would these additional areas belong? They would belong to the owners of the adjacent lands. Applying the Spanish law of waters. If you own a parcel of land, let's say in La Union, and through the action of the sea, your land gradually increased in area. That's why Tabindagat. Who would own the additional area? Ah, kabalikat sa kaunlaran. Pag natin pakialaman yan, that belongs to the state. Itong alubyon, applicable lang sa rivers. Hindi kasama dito mga shores of the seas. Pero, Applying the Spanish law of waters, if what is involved is a lake, like Laguna de Bay, the additional area will also belong to the owner of the adjacent land. Kung sino may ari ng property.